Thank you so much, Dr. Mendel. It's uh, a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, a rainy day here in Rochester, but we are warming up a little bit, probably not as warm as you are yet, but uh, it's a uh, pleasure to, to, to meet you all virtually and to talk about this topic, the telemedicine musculoskeletal examination. Um, as uh, Dr. Mendel said, I'm, I actually co-directed sports medicine with Dr. Mike Stewart, who many of you may know for, for about 28 years, just transitioned from that role. I uh, work in the departments of physical medicine and rehab and also the division of orthopedics, a division of sports medicine and department of orthopedics. So um, and I put a lot of musculoskeletal stuff on my Twitter account. So if any of you follow Twitter, I'm at, at Dr. Ed Sports Med and happy to, to meet you and, and converse with you there as well. So hopefully this will be a, a fun uh, time to talk about this telemedicine that has really exploded upon us. You know, I, I had never done a telemedicine musculoskeletal examination evaluation or virtual evaluation prior to COVID. Um, Mayo Clinic had, Mayo Clinic had actually pioneered some as far as stroke um, telehealth and, and, and as far as reaching people in remote settings and underserved populations. So there certainly had been at Mayo Clinic as a whole, but I personally in our, our area, our department really had not uh, done any of these evaluations. But as you, we all know with COVID that caused explosive growth in the field of telemedicine per se. And, and I think we learned a lot from, from this experience about what telemedicine can do and, and really how to utilize it better and more efficiently. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cost efficient, it's uh, safe, certainly, it's time effective and uh, very convenient for patients. So those are certainly advantages. And I think even in the, in the emerging COVID, post-COVID environment, we're now continuing to provide a lot of telehealth services in ways that we didn't before. Um, and again, we can we can do that in a safe fashion for both uh, for both healthcare professionals and patients themselves. So a lot of applications and uses. The musculoskeletal, we, we call it the 85, 85, 85 percent of uh, sports medicine injuries are musculoskeletal. 85 percent of those are non operative. So they're and, and actually it's the number one reason why patients will see a physician. If you look at CDC disease counts is a musculoskeletal condition. So, you know, we always joke, we see everybody from the board of governors to the janitors, everybody has some kind of neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, hip pain, knee pain, ankle pain. So, uh, the, and it's been amazing this, I've given this lecture to a lot of primary care providers throughout the world actually, because musculoskeletal is so common. Um, we, it's the number one thing that a physician will see. So. When we, when this all started, uh, I when we I started doing these exams, it, I didn't know how to do them, and uh, and the patients didn't know what to expect. So you'd be in a, a setting where the patient was dark; I couldn't see them. They weren't dressed properly. The kids were behind them. The dog was playing with a ball behind them. There was distractions. I couldn't see. I saw their forehead for the whole valley. <laughs> I didn't see their joints. So, you know, we began to say, well, how can we do this better? And how can we provide some guidelines for for docs for doing these exams, but also for the patients? Um, and how can we prepare them for the exam a bit better? So we, we took the common joints that, that people may complain about, shoulder, hip, knee, ankle, and then cervical and lumbar spine. And we tried to develop a set of guidelines, uh, also visual guidelines, both picture, pictorial and video, to, to help us to get the most information that we can from these exams. So we published this paper online first, and then it came out in print in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in August of 2020. And you're welcome to access this paper. When you access this paper, you also access all the images. Um, we have them all there for you and all the videos. So there are links embedded in the paper to all the videos that we, we have made. And we actually send these videos out. So if I'm gonna see a patient for a shoulder complaint, We'll send out a general introduction video, which you'll see kind of a, how, to, how to prepare for a telemedicine exam in less than five minutes, and also a joint specific exam. So if we're gonna examine the shoulder, you'll get the shoulder video. 
And, and this will familiarize the patient with what they're going to have to do. So it makes them more comfortable. It makes them know about the setting that they're going to have this exam in um, and what they should have, how they should prepare, what the examiner may ask them to do. So, so it's, it really helps. We send this a day before the exam, both the general and the joint specific um, video. And so that's been very helpful. So these videos will be embedded in the, the article itself, as well as the pictures. So again, that, that, that's accessible to you all as well. So we tried to, to have both written and visual aids, written more for us, for the, the, the clinician, the provider doing the evaluation, and also visual aids for both to help us to get the most information possible when we're examining these joints. And, and we wanted to really show real time, so we wanted to do videos that, that actually showed demonstrating certain these physical examination maneuvers, which we asked the patient to perform. So that was the hard part is, you know, we all know what, we, what the validity is and the sensitivity and the specificity of some of our physical exam maneuvers for face-to-face. -face. But when we're asking the patient to do it, it's, you know, it's a different story. So again, we, I, this is iteration number one, and you all may have much better ideas and we'll probably have multiple iterations after that, but we tried to base the examination maneuvers that we had the patient perform based on validated physical maneuver, physical exam maneuvers that we perform in our face-to-face -face encounters. But we tried to find ways to modify it to have the patient perform those maneuvers themselves. So a couple of things for general considerations, we wanted to just mention that, um, you know, the examiner will look at the video image of the patient, but, but really should also look at the camera as that's the equivalent of looking the patient in the eye. Sometimes I think we're, you know, we're too much down here and we're, we're looking at the screen and maybe looking at our notes and tests and the patient doesn't feel like they're, they're connecting with you and looking at you. So again, remembering to look at the, the camera as well. And that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, and really pre preempting, just telling the patient that, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to look away at times. So I'm going to take some notes. I'm going to adjust the, the settings here. I'm going to pull up your x-rays, things like that. So, so they know what's happening when we look away from the screen. They, they think we're not ignoring them or, or doing something else. Uh, we find often there is an audio lag depending on people's connections and internet connections. So, you know, maybe may, a good idea is maybe to give the patient about a couple seconds or so after they stop talking uh, before we speak, uh, because that audio lag may be, may be in there. And again, I think just as in general, we, we don't want to forget the general principles of physical exam, a uniform history, a uniform examination sequence that makes us efficient, that makes us thorough, and it avoids errors of omission. I think sometimes in telemedicine, we can kind of go right to where we think the problem is. But I think, again, just going back to the basics and remembering all the, the history that we need to obtain and, 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 again, trying to get as much information from the exam. As we all know, patients uh, can describe pain many different ways in many different areas. And I know, you know, hip pain, what is that, right? What is it, groin pain? Is it lateral hip pain? Is it anterior thigh pain? Is it low back pain? Is it SI pain? So one thing we'd said is one finger. We request a patient use one finger to point to the maximal area of pain. And also when they delineate pain, to use one finger to delineate that. It's, it's even more diffuse in the video setting. So the more we can have specificity there, that, that it's helpful. And, uh, and one thing also is maybe to have the examiner demonstrate the exam maneuver for the patient as appropriate. So if we're having them test supraspinatus, maybe we ourselves say, oh, okay, I want you to hold your arm out here and apply some resistance and just make it a little bit forward of horizontal. And, and if they can see us doing that, that, that also will help them in self-performing that exam maneuver. Uh, a couple of things we needed, we've, we, we found we needed to have, again, a lot of the patients that I saw, they were in limited environments that were dark. I couldn't see them. I couldn't, I, when they walked, I couldn't see where they were, that they, they were on, the only one there. So when they walked, I couldn't see them anymore. And so they have to have adequate room in the, in the field, the visual field to perform a full range of motion about the joints in which we're going to evaluate. And also if we need to, if we're going to assess gait and sit to stand transitions, we need to be able to see that. So, uh, you know, an adequate room that is well lit, very important. 
Um, we want the room to be free of distractions, uh, uncluttered background, adequate lighting. You know, again, like I said, we had dogs, kids, spouses, everybody going in the background and uh, very hard to kind of sort out things when, when there's a lot of distractions in the field. We really recommend that an additional person be with the, the patient during a virtual examination. I think just really, really helps capture what we want better. Um, and it, it enables a patient not to get frustrated by trying to position the camera in ways they may not be able to effectively. Um, but we, you know, we wanted, we wanted them sometimes lying down, sometimes standing full length. We want a full body view. So really to get those, it's nice to have somebody else to control the camera or at least uh, be there with the camera to, to enable the patient to get in these positions. If, we, uh, if we're looking uh, at, a, at a younger individual, a small child, toys that the child can reach for, manipulate, hold for comfort, give you an idea about range of motion and all, that's a good idea to do. And so we made a general video, and this general video, again, this will be sent out to everybody who gets a virtual evaluation, and then again, joint specific, and that's what we'll go through next. And this general video we're going we're gonna to see next, um, <laughs> we tried to have a little fun with this. So it's early in the morning, but this, kinda, this, this is our uncut version. We have Mayo Patient Education made this a little more sanitized, but we wanted to make this engaging. We wanted to make this a little fun. We did this on a, on a whim, to, to, but just to kind of get people comfortable with with what they're going to do, uh, what they're going to have to see. So uh, with, without further ado, here's our general considerations video. Hi, I'm Dr. Ed Laskowski, and I'm a physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation and sports medicine at Mayo Clinic Rochester. I'd like to share just a few thoughts on your upcoming telehealth examination. Video examinations can give us a lot of information, they, they're not a substitute for your face-to-face -face exam, but we can still gain a lot of information to hopefully help you out and give you some suggestions to help you deal with your condition. I'll give you some tips on, on how to set yourself up for a successful telehealth examination. First of all, uh, you, you want enough space. The doctor may ask you to walk to and from the camera, so you want enough space that you can be walking forward and backwards and the camera can catch this, uh, it's nice if you can have somebody else holding the camera. It's always easier. So if someone else is available to help you, uh, that would always be um, recommended. And uh, I think it would enable you to do more movements and feel less impeded by anything. So somebody else to hold the camera is a good thing. Enough space is a good thing. Uh, a room free of distractions. Uh, we love your pets and, and everything else, but we, it's kind of distracting if they're in the field of view. So kind of keeping the room clear of distractions and as little possible in the room so we can see you well, that's a good thing. Uh, proper lighting in the room is also good. It helps us to see things very well. Uh, and your doctor, when you, when you see them in the, in, the, um, in the video, they'll probably be dressed like this. And uh, they'll ask you some questions, they'll interview you. Uh, but this is an examination. So your doctor will be dressed like this, but we want you to be able to show us the areas of the problem. So if you have a problem in your neck or your shoulders, your doctor's probably going to want to see those areas. So what we can do is have on something that will permit the doctor to see as much as possible. This could be a, a t-shirt, this could be a tank top, this could be a, a shirt that's easily uh, chain movable and lift upable so we can see as many areas as possible. But if we, if we have a, a neck problem or a shoulder problem, we're going to want to see those areas. Make sure you have enough room to move your limbs during the examination. We're gonna have you move and, whoop, and not hit things in the ceiling like I just did. <laughs> but you wanna, you wanna have enough room to move around so the doctor can see the range of motion about your joints. You wanna be able to make sure that the doctor can see the areas that are problematic for you. So if it's a neck problem, you wanna be able to show them all the areas of the neck that are troublesome to you. If it's a shoulder problem, you wanna be able to show them all the areas of the shoulder that might be troublesome to you. Same thing goes for the elbow and for the wrists. If you have a back problem, you wanna make sure that you have a shirt that you can pull up so that the doctor can get a view of the low back. And this could be, again, a loose fitting shirt or anything that just lets them get a good view. And that will permit good and, and easy motion. 
Um, if you have a problem in the hips or the legs or in the back because the nerves in the back go in the legs, the doctors want to go and want to see a little bit more. So you want to make sure that you have exposure of the joints that the doctor's looking at. And lots of times it's nice to have just uh, bare feet because sometimes shoes we can't assess as we want to with shoes and socks on. So if you have a hip problem, you're going to want to wear shorts. If you have a knee problem, if you have an ankle problem, we're going to want to see those joints. So make sure you wear something comfortable to enable us to see those. Um, it's nice if you have a table nearby. Uh, and uh, if, if some of these maneuvers we may have you do on the floor, so a mat that you can put on the floor so we can have you lie on your back and do some maneuvers, that's helpful as well. If you do have an additional person besides the camera person, sometimes to assist with some of these maneuvers, that's a good thing as well. But uh, overall, you know, we want as much information as possible. And by looking at you and having you do some maneuvers, again, we may have you walk, go up on your toes, go up on your heels, move your joints around. Those all are helpful movements that give us information uh, about what's going on with you. So I hope uh, this was helpful for you. And we look forward to seeing you on your telehealth examination. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of fun there, but uh, but also just hopefully we included enough in there that we give them the 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 background of what to expect. Again, patients have not done this before either, so I can't tell you the spectrum of of things that I saw when we first start doing these, as I'm sure you guys know. So um, the more we can kind of prepare them for what's going to happen, uh, the better. So they'll get this general video. Plus, uh, we're going to now go into the joint specific exam video. So if they have shoulder pain or knee pain or ankle pain or, or, or hip pain, we'll, they'll get a specific video as well. We've been finding this is working out really well. Um, this was uh, a little bit uh, sanitized for, our, for distribution before we did it, but um, still wanted to keep some fun in there. So let's just go through the shoulder um, evaluation. So this is the shoulder video. We just tell them that, you know, we may do different things, but we want to give them some landmarks. So localizing the pain, we point out some space of the clavicle, the AC joint, the subacromial space, some things we may ask them to, to terms they may hear too. Range of motion, we tried to put it in simple terms, raise your arm above your head from the front and to the side. So we're looking at full forward flexion at the shoulder in addition to abduction of the shoulder. Okay, and just for extra and internal rotation, we kind of get them set to zero point at the at 90 degrees at the side. So hopefully we measure external rotation and then internal rotation, keeping the elbow stable. Holding arm at shoulder height with thumbs pointed down. Use your other arm to provide pressure. You may recognize, so this is the empty can test, supraspinatus test. Patient applied resistance. Hold your elbow bent at 90 degrees to shoulder height, rotating your hand up. Okay, is this an apprehension test? Okay, if you're worried about apprehension, that's gonna provide that anterior lever arm force. Press on your AC joint, okay? Just kind of refreshing them where that is, but there is a pain there. We can do a scarf sign to see if that provokes pain in the AC joint region, self-performed. Bent elbow at bent at 90 and at shoulder height. Okay, rotating your hand down. You're gonna recognize this as a self-performed Hawkins test of impingement. Trying to keep that, that shoulder stable while they do that and rotate that cuff underneath the subacromial arch. Raising your arm above your head, thumb pointing down, you'll recognize this is nearest test of impingement. So self-perform, when does the pain occur in that arc? Probably right at the top, if they do have some degree of subacromial impingement. Hold palm up and raise arm to shoulder height. Use opposite arm to apply pressure. You're gonna recognize this as speeds test to create a long lever arm to provide to the long head of the biceps tendon. Resist turning your hand from neutral to palm up, okay? And that's gonna be Jurgensen's test for the biceps tendon. A little bit more difficult for the patient to perform. Um, speeds is, is probably a little bit better to use for the self virtual exam and also just palpation itself for the biceps tendon region. 
a belly press test. So this is, as we know, testing subscapularis. So we can just assess do their arms lag back there. And that would be indicative of some significant subscap involvement. And here we're trying to have them generate some force against a door frame. So that's external rotation. Is that provoking of pain? So against an inanimate object, can be a door frame, can be another object, but push your hand against a stable object, such as a door frame. Again, we're gonna go the opposite direction. So we're gonna rotate inward. So that's testing our internal rotators of the shoulder. Raise your arm straight out in front of your face, thumbs point down, apply downward pressure with the opposite hand. This is a O'Brien's test. So a little bit of feel of, of the labrum, uh, get that greater tuberosity and against that anterior lip of the labrum. Now we're gonna turn the palm up to get that away. Does it change with each of those? So that's position one, position two of self-performed O'Brien's test. Okay, so the brief survey. So you can see there we assess, we have ways to assess range of motion. And you can do, you can certainly do reaching up the back. I just find that at 90 degrees, it gets that set point better. And then we can kind of more accurately assess the, the degrees. And, and if we're, we're having them reach behind and all, if they have a hot cuff, that's, that's, we're asking them almost to do impingement signs on themselves. So, so we can assess range of motion pretty nicely with a virtual exam. Again, the, the Hawkins and Nears test of impingement reasonable to do self-performed. We can assess the muscle strength pretty good. We can do a self a self applied supraspinatus test. And then with that inanimate object, we can do an external rotator, internal rotator test. We can try some special tests. We can have them poke on the AC joint. Is that where the pain is? We can try the scarf sign. Uh, we can try to look at biceps with speeds and Jurgensen's test. And we can try and get a little clue with, uh, with O'Brien's test, uh, position one and position two, if they can do that just a little bit for not straight, but just a little bit of horizontal adduction from zero uh, for that position one. Um, and, and we can get a lot of information from those. So that's shoulder and moving down to hip. And we wanted to, again, have both lying down and maybe seated positions. Some people may not be able to, to do the lying down one. So walking to and from the camera, we get information, as we all know from this, is there a Trendelenburg? Do they have weak hip abductors? Um, you know, a lot of information just from normal gates. We want them to walk on their toes. That's S1 nerve root, as we all know. So if you're worried about a neurologic component or ridic ridiculous component, can they walk on their toes or rise on their toes repeatedly? And walking on heels, that would be mostly L5 component. Again, there's a lot of overlap there, but... That's the L5 nerve root when they walk on their heels. A double leg squat gives us a lot of information. As you know, do they have dynamic medial knee valgus? Does that knee cave in? How do they control movement when they perform that activity? Are they diving in with their knee and the, into a valgus? A single leg squat really emphasizes that. As you know, dynamic medial knee valgus feeds into a ton of hip problems in younger individuals, snapping hip, uh, patellofemoral pain, distal ITB syndrome, hopping on one foot. Again, if we're worried about a stress injury even, that can be helpful, or our intraarticular joint problem, osteoarthritis of the hip. Just give them some landmarks about localizing the pain. We point out some of the terms we may be looking, the greater trochan or the PSIS, just areas that they may poke at. They don't have to know them per se. So we wanted to do some while they're lying on their back. So knee to chest. So we're looking at hip flexion. And then with the hip bend at 90, rotate your foot in and out, we tell them. So when they rotate your foot in, that's external rotation. When they rotate the foot out, that's gonna be internal rotation. So that was external, this is internal, self-performed, trying to keep that knee stable and the thigh stable as well, we can tell them. Hip range of motion while seated. So if they're unable to lie down, we find a towel maybe is a nice tool to rotate the foot in and out. So if they keep that thigh bone and knee stable, we can assess external rotation again, and it's external and then internal rotation in a self-performed fashion. Get an idea if there's any limitations or pain provocation with those maneuvers. Towel works pretty slick. Special maneuvers that we can try. 
place your ankle on the opposite knee as kind of a cueing for that, uh, lying down or seated. So this is our Faber's test, right? Flexion, abduction, external rotation. They can apply. And again, where is the pain? Is it, is it anterior thigh and groin or is it SI joint? but we can have them assess that, or we can have them assess it seated if they are unable to go in a lying position. It's Faber's test, modified to, for self-performing. Raise your leg straight up and apply downward pressure. So you recognize this is Stinchfield's test. This is a resisted straight leg raise. You're levering that femur against the capsule, the hip. So is that, uh, is that provoking of pain? That would be indicative of an intra-articular hip pathology. So you can do that when they're lying down, or if they can't lie down, we can try that in a seated position, okay? And again, there's a lot of the hip flexor pain could be associated with this as well. We'd have to sort that out depending on where they feel it. Bring your knee toward the opposite shoulder while lying down. Okay, this is almost a Fadir test, right? Where we're scouring the hip with the, uh, scouring the acetabulum with the femoral head. So is that provoking of pain? That could indicate a labral tear or an intra-articular hip problem if that's positive. We can do a basic log roll with their legs straight. That's easy enough for them to do. Is that provoking of them? And if it is where, is it groin, anterior thigh, or lateral hip? At the edge of a better table, grab your knee and roll back. So we're trying to get an idea of their hip flexor, flexibility there. So a modified Thomas test. Does their hip come up? And um, we don't have it in the field of view that right here, but as the knee straightening out too, is there, and do they have tightness in that ileus, ile, the uh, rectus femoris? And now we're using a towel again to assist and we can actually assess a popliteal angle or a test of hamstring flexibility from zero degrees, how, how tight are they? If they're able, they can hang the painful leg off a better table. There aren't a lot of sensitive and specific SI joint tests, but this is a kind of a modified Gainsland, at least to attempt to provide some shear force to that SI joint. And again, we need to know where the pain is that is in the SI region or is it somewhere else? So again, so we have a cadre of self-performed maneuvers. So we have range of motion, external rotation, internal rotation. They can do that in a lying position. They can do it in a seated position. A towel is a nice way to assist with that. You can look at popliteal angle with a towel as well and assess that popliteal angle to the tightness of the hamstrings. The special tests we can perform lying or seated. So the favors test we can perform lying or seated. Uh, the FIDIR test or a modified FIDIR doesn't have actually the internal rotation component as much, but that could be be a kind of a provoking test for intra-articular hip pathology. We can do that in a lying or seated position as well. So, uh, and again, trying to get some information about the SI joint, where the pain is, where the pain is located. So, so that's our hip. And again, all these videos are, are available to you. This is our knee video. So again, basic, again, we, these stand alone. So we can send each one of these videos. So we try and there's repetition of some of the things that we'll have a patient do. So we'll have them walk again. We wanna see, do they have genuvalgus, genuvarum? Is there any alignment issues, uh, any antalgia? And again, double and single leg squats give us a ton of information on motor control. Is that knee going inward? Do they have dynamic medial knee valgus? What is their movement pattern um, during those maneuvers? He has a little dynamic meaning in Vegas himself. Localize your pain. Okay, we give them some basic structures that we may be, and again, they don't have to know these terms, but we're going to maybe ask them to point to these areas, and we may use these terms when we're talking to them. Uh, is the is there is any patellofemoral pain components? So we just want them to know that they can push that kneecap aside and assess for tenderness in the patellar facets and uh, palpate those patellar facets. They, again, they don't have to know these terms, but just we may be using those terms or asking them to, to look in those areas. Uh, just basically bend and straighten their knee. We want to get an idea of what their range of motion is about the knee joint as a whole. Pretty easy there. They can do that in a seated position or in a lying down position. Uh, quadriceps flexibility, a elite test. Uh, so heel to buttock. So we measure, compare symmetry. And again, just in the interest of time, but certainly symmetry side to side is important. Using your other leg, push your ankle in and out. So this is actually a varus and valgus stress test. And we can do that in a seated as well as a lying position. So that's a little bit of MCL-LCL assessment. 
Benjini and move your torso left and right three times. So you may remember, recognize this as a, as a modified Thessaly's test. So we're trying to, to have them self-assess uh, just a little bit of knee flexion initially, and then about 30 degrees of knee flexion with rotation. Does that provoke any joint line pain? So it's kind of a self-performed, patient-performed Thessaly test. Again, hopping on one foot, is there any stress involvement or does that provoke pain in any way? So the, the information with the knee, again, range of motion is pretty easy to assess in the knee. So our basic planes of flexion and extension. Uh, we kind of use the, the, the palpation uh, as, a, as a helpful, again, you can palpate patellar tendon, the patellar facets, the joint lines for sure, um, in meniscal and, and osteoarthritis. Um, and we, you know, the provoking test, we thought that, that kind of hooking your, your ankle around there to provide a varus and valgus stress, those planes of motion were kind of interesting to assess MCL and LCL. And they're really not a good way to assess the ACL um, self-performed that I've found. Um, and again, Thessaly's test is, does that exacerbate selective joint line pain and, and associated with that joint line tenderness? So again, just trying to get as much information as we can out of each of these examinations. For the ankle exam, uh, again, we're, we're we're repeating some some things, but and we're looking at different areas. So again, walking to and from the camera, do they have pes planus, pes cavus? Do they have antalgia? How is their alignment? Walking on toes again, that's S1 nerve root, but also do they reconstitute their arch? Is posterior tibialis functioning well when they do this? And again, walking on their heels, that's L5, but also this is gonna hurt somebody with an Achilles tendon problem or plantar fasciopathy, plantar fasciitis. Rise up in their toes. So if we're suspicious of an Achilles tendinopathy or tendinitis, certainly stressing that tendon is gonna be helpful information. Does that provoke the pain more? We're gonna get a good look at it too. Is it swollen there? Do they have retrocalcaneal swelling? Going to give them some landmarks to localize the pain as well. That we're just going to be maybe mentioning these terms, looking at these areas: the malleoli, the metatarsal, the calcaneus, the Achilles tendon. Just going to get an idea of foot range of motion, up and down, in and out. So we're anterior tibialis function, posterior tibialis function, perineal or fibularis group function. And we're again, we're going to use that inanimate object to provide resistance. So does it hurt? Is posterior tib tender? Was it painful when they when they kind of try and rotate in against the wall? Up and out, again, that's going to test our perineal or fibularis group. So up and out. So pressing against that inanimate object is a nice way to kind of provoke pain. Thompson test you may be familiar with. If, if they kind of squeeze and there's no plantar flexion, that may be indicative of an Achilles tendon rupture or significant tear. Palpating from Mulder's click, do they have metatarsal pain? We maybe kind of elicit that more with having them self-palpate that area. That may be indicative of a Morton's neuroma. And again, is there a stress injury? You see a lot of people with some stress fractures and the metatarsals are simple ways having to do the hop test. So again, very nice, simple cadre of things that we're looking at. He has a pretty good amount of pes planus right there, but we can, if we, if we have a good view and, and a good, good camera angle on him, we can see a lot of these things. And again, we used uh, an inanimate object in the ankle exam to kind of push inward and assess that posterior tibialis or push outward against it, up and outward to assess that fibularis or perineal group. Again, a little hard to get, you know, it's an up and out move. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to focus on technique and then trying to get a, get them to do it as good as they can. Uh, general range of motion. We're looking at that Achilles tendon. We're having them stress the Achilles tendon. Um, uh, again, is there painful at any of the areas? Again, a lateral ankle sprain. We're going to have them look at that ATF and those, those lateral swelling areas. So again, a fair amount of information that we can get. Moving on to the spine, we, we see a lot of neck pain and we see a lot of low back pain. So how can we assess that in a more discreet fashion? Again, we're going to, again, with a lot of repetition because we're, these are standalone um, videos that we can send. So we're still going to want to assess that global mechanics and alignment. Um, if they have low back pain, especially, it's going to be important to assess the S1 nerve root by toe walking and, and the L5 nerve root by heel walking. 
Let's so tell walking for S1 and heel walking L5. Again, these are general, there's overlap, but in general, they're, they're kind of good screens for those nerve roots. Walk toe to heel, so a tandem gait. So do they have balance instability problems with balance? Um, any bit of perturbation there that we need to know about. Uh, the low back per se, we can assess range of motion planes. Um, and again, just getting to feel where the pain, where we may ask them to, to look at. So ischial tuberosity, the bone that you sit on, greater trochanter out to the side, PSIS, SI joint regions. In the sagittal plane, we can have them bend forward and, and look at that lumbar spine flexion. So a good way to assess that. And, and we can also just have them bend backwards, trying to keep the, the knees real straight. So we can assess lumbar spine extension in that way. On one foot, rise up on your toes, repeat multiple times. This again, it's gonna assess the gastrophax. So forward about S1 radiation. And again, squat, very useful test to, to look at in both legs. So is there a dynamic medial knee valgus? Tim Hewitt has shown us so much about what that indicates. Reflexes are interesting. Um, I found a, a cell phone, works really good. <laughs> a spatula if they have it in the kitchen, but a cell phone actually that has kind of a nice heft and bulk. And if they, they have that heel on the, on, the, uh, on the ground like that, it really elicits a pretty nice response. So, so we found so almost everybody has one on, on them. So nice tool to use. When seated straight in your knee, is that provocative of any pain? That's a, basically a seated straight leg raise. We can enhance the dural traction by having them slump forward with their knee extended. That's a dural traction test. Do they have reproduction of radicular pain in the leg with that test? Is there a posterior element involvement? Our younger athletes with spondylolysis, we want to assess that. So it's the stork test or single leg back extension. And how about the opposite too? If they're, if they're lying down, they can do a back extension. Is there posterior element involvement? That could be a pars inter articularis or uh, just actually arthritis in the facets. We're going to, again, because we're going to have a little bit of repetition, we want to make sure Faber's, that's, that's a nice test to perform as well for the back. So neck range of motion, the same way we can get some nice, uh, nice uh, assessment with sagittal views for neck flexion and neck extension. And uh, in the frontal plane, look left and right, we can get an idea of their rotation, their side bending. Is there any restriction? Is there any compensation, any hiking? Uh, triceps dip, if they can, <laughs> you can assess C7 with a triceps dip. That's a nice way to kind of have their body weight. They have to use triceps to extend there. So if you're worried about C7. Biceps reflex, again, using that cell phone, <laughs> really, really not a bad way to do it. And uh, it provides a pretty nice bulk and heft to get that biceps tendon. A spatula is something else we found that's helpful. Uh, looking at clonus. Okay, do they have any clonus? Are you worried about a central and upper motor neuron process? We'll have them perform a self-performed clonus test for upper motor neuron. And the, the famous Babinski test, pretty easy to self-perform. Draw a pen up from that lateral to medial. We'll just show them how to do it, the outer edge of the foot. We don't want to see the toes fan out. We want to see them have a flexion moment. And open and close, rapid alternating movements. Good idea of, uh, gives you a good idea of coordination and and rapid alternating movements in the upper extremities and the lower extremities, tapping their foot as fast as they can, can give an idea of cerebellar involvement. Spurling's maneuver, if you're worried about an upper extremity radiculopathy, we wanna narrow that foramen on the side we're worried about, does it reproduce radicular upper extremity pain? With arms up, close, hold for one minute. So this is a ruse test for thoracic outlet syndrome. Again, not that many sensitive and specific tests for thoracic outlet, but actually in the literature for evidence-based ruse is probably one of the best. So that's probably one they can self-perform pretty well. And if they, they do that for about one minute, may give you some idea of where they feel the pain and if that, that could be a component. 
So again, uh, nice ways in the cervical and lumbar spine of assessing range of motion, the sagittal and frontal plane, we can do that. Um, we can look at stressing selectively the posterior elements, those facets, if we're worried about lumbar spine degenerative change, or in a younger individual, if we're worried about a pars interarticular stress fracture, we can do that sim single leg hyperextension in that sagittal plane. Um, we can do some provoking tests. Um, the Faber's test and the and the and the, again lying or seated position, and uh, that spatula or the cell phone for the reflexes. We found actually patients do a, a pretty good job with that, um, but that's often one we have to assist them with just to get in a stable position to do those examination maneuvers. So if you go in and the web and in the uh, in our article, we have pictures as well. So these are to assist uh, the provider as well as the patient. So we, we kind of try and have a pictorial description of all the tests that we're, we're going to recommend as well, um, just to help the provider as much as possible to, to give the information that they, they need to have. So all these tests that we just described in video format are also in pictorial format. We don't send the patient the pictures, uh, but again, we do send the patient that intro video and a joint specific specific video uh, pertinent to their complaint. And we, we, again, in our article, we described this a lot more. We went through those really fast, um, but, you know, we, and again, for the video, we didn't want to overwhelm the patient with too much. We just wanted to give them an idea. I think knowledge is power and preparation. If the more they know what they're going to have to do and how they're going to have to do it and what's going to be in the room and what position they're going to be in, I think the better. So if we can kind of give them just that preemptive uh, view, I think that's, that's very helpful. Uh, for the provider, we're, we're, we do this in much more detail. So certainly, again, you all are welcome to, to just search that article. It'll come up for you. Um, it's the telemedicine musculoskeletal examination, Mayo Clinic proceedings. Um, and uh, the whole article should be there as well as the pictures and videos. But we really describe the positions, how to, how to get them in a position for your most successful, uh, for their most successful self-perform maneuver and for your most su successful um, elicitation of information there. And again, we tried to, um, <laughs> these are self-performed. So we're, you know, this is, this is a new territory. We, we tried to base these as much as possible on validated, uh, sensitive, and specific physical examination maneuvers that we all would do if, in a face-to-face -face encounter. Um, but in the telemedicine domain and the virtual domain, again, it's going to be very variable according to how precise patients are, how, how selective they are. Again, they'll <laughs> they'll move like this. There's no shoulder movement at all. So to really get them to stabilize the area and all, it's, it's, it's a challenge sometimes. So again, the more they can see, the more they can see us do it, uh, the more information we can give them beforehand, that it's going to set us up for success better. But, um, you know, the limitation is these are self-performed maneuvers. So we, we really is, it's very patient independent. And uh, again, we tried to have them uh, <laughs> there may be constraints in the examination that they have. So they may not be able to lie down. So again, these we've tried to adapt these to a seated position as well. Again, sensitivity not as well tested in the face-to-face -face in those positions. But again, the maneuvers are the same. The principles are the same. We're trying to do the same with each of these maneuvers. So, so hopefully they'll give us some information that's useful for us. So just overall, again, it's, uh, you know, it's here to stay telemedicine, right? It's, it's an important role in the delivery of, of care, and it's going to be continued to be important uh, in the future. Uh, our, our CEO at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Ferugia, thinks that maybe by 2030, we'll have up to 50% virtual evaluations. So um, again, it's, 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 really, it's really here to stay. Uh, we can certainly gain information from the telehealth exam uh, when evaluating these joints um, that, that is useful to us. Uh, and you can imagine for post-operative, for follow-up visits, uh, for triage, you know, still, and despite all this, I, you know, as we all know, there's nothing that supplants a face-to-face -face and just having hands on the person, certainly Lachman's for the ACL. I mean, how can we do that virtually? But, uh, but you know, this is helpful. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of uses for telemedicine, but uh, certainly not supplanting all those things. But you can imagine follow-up. You can imagine rehabilitation exercise instruction. Uh, you can imagine triage of care, what tests we're going to need to to order when they come to see us. A lot of people come to see us from far away. We've, we've found it a nice triage tool. 
Um, and, and really, again, again, we th I threw a lot of stuff at you. We can modify this according to the patient. And again, we have patients of all ages, all ranges. So, you know, it's they're, they're, we're going to have to modify what we have them do, depending on what they can do. So, and also the provider, and we have a lot of people doing musculoskeletal examinations. Our, our, I do a lot of lectures for our, our internal medicine population, our general internal medicine population. They're hungry for musculoskeletal information because that's, that's the main thing they see and they don't get a lot of education. They don't get a lot of, of, of emphasis on this domain. So the more information we can give the provider on how to gain the best information from the patient, the better. And in the future, I'm sure we're going to, you know, this is, again, iteration one, we're going to have iteration 17 of this and, and really kind of come up with some nice ways of validating some uh, patient perform maneuvers that give us uh, sensitive information and accurate information about, about what's going on. I thank you very much. I'm ending a little bit early, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to present this information for you. I know we're having a lot of, uh, you know, one thing that I'm sure Judge will, will talk, talk about is, uh, you know, when COVID came, the, all the restrictions on telemedicine were lifted, so we could do this everywhere in every state. And I know those 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 liberties are, are changing, which I'm sure we'll we'll hear about. But if anybody has any um, questions now that I can answer for them. Uh, I'm happy to, or we can go right to the next session, whatever you wish. Uh, Ed, Pete Mandel again, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a question, at least one question here. Well, it was there. Uh, do you, are you able to share the, the video, the intro video that you uh, send out to patients? Is that something that we can all use. Yep, that's uh, um, yep, and you you can just take it off the the paper actually, um, and uh, you know so for your purposes, um, I'll check with our patient. We have a, a, a homogenized version, so I can check with our patient education. They've made it, and actually they've the titles, and they've just buffed it up really nicely too. So we have a, a more homogenized version. I can check with our patient education as well about the availability of that, and I can get back to you guys and disseminate that information. But anything that we have in the article is free for you, you all to use as far as um, the videos and, and pictures and content. Uh, and, and another question, as you know, probably better than I, uh, hospitals and health systems are surveying patients right and left all the time now. I, I presume they've uh, asked uh, your patients uh, having this type of uh, examination, what they think of it, what, what, what do they say? That is a fantastic question and is something that I think has surprised me the most of all this. Um, patients really seem to love this. I, I can't tell you how many patients say how good it is that, that we're connecting this way and how comfortable they feel, that just how reassured they feel talking with a, with a physician. Because I, I was thinking this is going to be, ah, you know, this is a, they, they're not going to like this. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be inferior. But I tell you, and I, and, and I think I, there's evidence-based studies out there as well, but from my personal experience as well, this, this seems to be a very well-received format. And patients are very, very appreciative of us uh, doing it this way. Um, a lot of the patients will have concerns, safety concerns. So they're really appreciative that we can come to them and give them information in that way. Um, they really appreciate uh, talking directly to the physician. Uh, and, and I think there's something about, you know, we, we did phone calls as well. Um, as virtual evals when COVID first hit. So we did phone exams as well. And there may have been limitations for technology and people just didn't have the equipment or that didn't know how to do it or whatever. Um, and, uh, and people universally like the, the visual better. It's just, there's something about that connection and seeing somebody and a lot of intangibles, I think, um, about it. But, uh, you know, and, and again, people may chime in if, if others have had different experiences, but um, universally, it's been, been very positively received and very well received. And, and another question here is, uh, uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with the workers' comp system in Minnesota. I'm not familiar with it at all. Uh, but uh, have you heard of any uh, pros or cons or criticisms of this kind of approach in treating injured workers? Well, I, I probably can address that the best as I do mostly, I, I really have, don't see much of that population at all. I have a sports medicine practice. Um, uh, 
I, I can't think, but it would be helpful though. And I, I think, again, the assessment that, we, again, the, the specific assessment that we may need for percents of disability and those specific parameters, uh, that may be a little more difficult from a virtual exam. But, uh, you know, the, the general information, the assessment, the, the, uh, the, gen the, the things that we look at with respect to those patients, I, I think we can gain a lot of helpful information, whether it's going to be consistently enough to satisfy the criteria area of what we need to determine some of these things that I'm not sure that in combination with a with a therapist a physical therapist directed functional evaluation though or things like that you know may be very helpful um, there, there's a comment here uh, from uh, dr. Anderson about how uh, the link took her to the general Mayo Clinic proceedings uh, is there a way to share the specific link uh, for the patient video uh, the specific patient video. Um, so if you go on the article, it should be in the article, but I'll send, I'll send the, I'll send you, I'll send the, the COA a, a, a specific link for everything. But if you go on the article, it should be, each of the videos should be embedded in the article. So in the general consideration section of the article, the patient video should be embedded in there. Um, but I will, I will send something to just so you have something available. And uh, another question here is, have you found these uh, telemedicine procedures useful in eliciting pain behavior? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, I think they can help as in anything. I, I think that, um, you know, exaggerated responses, um, things that don't correspond with what we're assessing, that gives us information as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think uh, most of them I've done, the patients have really been straightforward and forthright and trying to trying to provide the most information possible. But, uh, but I have been able to discern um, central sensitization and chronic pain syndrome also in some individuals uh, just by the, um, the uniform response they have to virtually all examination maneuvers, all palpation maneuvers, um, and, and that. So again, I think uh, it's very helpful. Once we see, again, via the phone, very hard, but via visual, I think much easier. So I think, again, it can give us helpful information in that regard. Um, and one other thing, uh, when, when you do one of these exams with a patient, uh, do you record that and do you make that part of the patient's chart? Uh, we we do record them. Yeah, that you're you're right. Yeah, we do record them and uh, yeah, and we have a a connected care uh, group that actually sets up. So it's the reason I had to think is it's so easy for me. I just click on the camera and I come on and the patient is there. But yeah, mm -hmm, we do. 